Okay, we're going to be talking about the difference between godly repentance and simply turning away from wrong behavior. I'm going to say that again because I want you to hear it. We're going to be talking about the difference between godly repentance and just simply turning away from wrong behavior. Now, Obadiah in the Old Testament, it's an Old Testament book. It's just only one chapter long, tiny little book, between the books of Amos and Jonah. Now, this tiny little book is a prophecy that was given to the prophet Obadiah, and he was, it was given to him through a vision. And he was prophesying what was going to happen to Esau's dependents. Now, by the time of this prophecy, now Esau's descendants were called the Edomites because uh, Esau's name had been somewhere along the way. It had been changed to Edom. So you have to remember that, uh, or it'll get a little confusing at some point. Now, Esau, you remember, was one of Abraham's grandsons. If you remember, it's Abraham, then Isaac, and then Isaac had the twin sons, Jacob and Esau. And Esau's tribe, years later, was going to be called the Edomites. And this book appears to have been written even before the prophet Jeremiah. Now, the Edomites later became a thorn in Israel's side. And Herod the Great, uh, when I look this up, he lived during the New Testament times, but he was a descendant of the Edomites. Now, after Jerusalem fell in A.D. 70, the Edomites vanished from history, and we never hear of them again. But that was prophesied. This prophet Obadiah prophesied that they would, the time would come there would be no more. And so in Obadiah, verse 3, God said, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. So he's talking about Esau's des descendants. Now, scholars believe that the Edomites were living in what is now called Petra. And this prophecy was given about 500 years before Christ came. Now, it was about 1,200 years after Esau actually lived. Now, when Jack went over to Israel, he was so excited because he got to go in into Jordan, and he got to go and see Petra. He had heard about Petra so long. And Petra is a city that's carved out of this huge rock. And uh, there's a very narrow passageway that goes into Petra, and there's no other way to get in. So, boy, the people who live in Petra, they really feel so protected because any enemy that comes uh, even near, they can't get in except through this one narrow passageway. And God said in Obadiah, verse 3, in the arrogance of your heart, he's talking about <clears throat> Esau's descendants. He said, as you live there in the cleft of that physical rock, we feel like he was talking about uh, Petra. He said, you think you're protected uh, in that lofty place. But he said, it's not going to do you any good. Now, Obadiah is talking to Esau's descendants. And Obadiah, verse 10, because of the violence now to your brother Jacob, okay, if you'll remember now, Esau uh, and Jacob are twin brothers. He said, because of the violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. So that was a pretty strong prophetic word. And then in part of uh, verse 15, it says, have you, as you have done, it's going to be done to you. Now, in Obadiah, verse 15, he went on to say, the time is growing near when the Messiah is going to come. Now, Jesus wasn't going to come for another 500 years. So 500 years doesn't sound like it's a, a close. But we have to remember now, this was first mentioned in Genesis now, 3,500 years before. So 500 years is growing pretty close when you think about the facts that 3,000 years have already gone by. Now, in Obadiah 15, he's talking to the descendants of Esau, and he says, For the day of the Lord now draws near on all the nations, and as you have done, it's going to be done to you. In other words, your dealings are going to return on your own head. So he's talking to all of Esau's descendants. Now, in Obadiah 17, this prophecy tells us now that the house of Jacob is going to possess Esau's possessions. In other words, the younger twin is going to, at some point, receive everything that belonged to the older twin, to uh, uh, Esau. Now, Obadiah 18 tells us the house of Jacob is going to be a fire, and the house now of Joseph is going to be a flame, but it says the house of Esau will be a stubble because they're go it's going to be burned up. So there's going to be no survivor in the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. And, of course, we know that that did happen. Now, at first glance, it appears that God is the one who's going to bring this destruction about to the Edomites. But always, if we look closely, we find where the 
destruction actually comes from. And so in Obadiah verse 15, as you have done, it's going to be done back to you, God said. In other words, your dealings are going to return on your own head. Now, the evil you sent out that was never repented of now, that very evil is what's going to absolutely just uh, come forth from you, and it's going to turn back and consume you. So we see here the law of sowing and reaping. What we sow is returned. Now, Esau and his descendants never repented. You know, I, I think we're going to see that clearly now uh, in the life of Esau and Jacob. Now, the Edomites, the descendants of Esau, were a very cruel group of people. Uh, they were cruel, especially to the Israelites. They were constantly coming against the Israelites, the descendants of Jacob. And uh, they treated them very harshly all through the Old Testament times. And now their cruelty now passed down from one generation to the next. Now, the only exception that we found is this. Earlier, when Jacob left his father-in-law, and he brought back his two wives and his two maids and all of the young children. You know, he, uh, he, he's going to have to meet Esau on the way. And when he does, Esau embraces him. He thinks that Esau's going to kill him. <laughs> but Esau embraces him and welcomes him home. And later, when their father Isaac dies, it's the two brothers now that bury their father together. But in time now, in Genesis 36, 6, Esau took his wives and he took his sons and his daughters and all of his livestock, everything that he had acquired in the land of Canaan, and he goes away to another land. Uh, and it isn't because he's angry. It's because his livestock have gotten so big and the livestock that belongs to uh, to, to his brother, uh, to Jacob, his fortune has grown so big that they can't live together. There's not room for them. So he decides to leave. Now, both of these twin brothers had sinned. So how is it now in uh, Obadiah 17 that it tells us that the house of Jacob now is going to possess all the possessions of the house of Esau? Because you think, well, they both sinned, you know. And it says there's going to be no survivors left in the house of Esau. Now, uh, not only now are we going to find that both boys have done wrong, both boys have sinned, but we're also going to find that both of these boys ch changed and quit doing the evil that they were doing. So they both sinned, they both changed. So at first glance, we think, well, Lord, what's the difference? If they both sinned and they both changed at some point, why is it that you're favoring Jacob and everything's going to be given to Jacob? Well, we have to go back now to Genesis 25 to the very beginning. And this is the story now of, of Jacob and Esau, and they're still living at home at this, t at this point. They're young. And so in Genesis 25, 21 through 34, Esau and Jacob are, <clears throat> they're kind of at odds. They're twin brothers, and they're kind of at odds. And um, so Jacob usually stays at home, and he likes to cook. So he's cooked up some food. And Esau comes in, he's a hunter, and he comes in and he's hungry, uh, but Jacob won't give him the food. And he said, I'm not going to give it to you unless you give me your birthright. Well, Esau was wrong because he despised his birthright. Uh, so, uh, and, and of course, that birthright meant a great deal to everybody in the Jewish nation because the firstborn was always the one who got the double portion of everything that the father owned. Plus, they got the spiritual blessing that came as a part of that birthright. Now, Jacob wanted the blessing. He wanted it so badly that he cheated, he manipulated, he stole, and he did everything to get it. Now, you all know the story of how his father Isaac was old by this time. He was blind, and he thought he was about to die. Now, we're going to find out that he lives a great many years longer. But at this point, he thinks he's fixing to die. So he said to his son Esau, who liked to hunt, he said, I want you to go out and I want you to kill a deer and prepare the meat and come and let me eat your wonderful food. And when you do, then I'll give you the blessing. Now, Isaac evidently was giving him the blessing because he was the older of the two twins, of the twins, um, or perhaps maybe he just liked the venison that he fixed for him. Who knows uh, what the answer was. But regardless now, Esau took off to get the food. Now, Rebecca, the mother, has overheard the conversation, and she already knows now that God has told her, even before the twins were born, that the younger was going to receive the blessing. So she knows that. But instead of just trusting God and deciding, you know, wondering, oh, God, how are you going to bring this to pass? She decides she's going to help God out. 
She's going to be sure that it happens. Uh, she's evidently afraid that God may forget what he promised. So she called Jacob, the younger son, and she had him bring in a kid from the flock. And she prepared the meat. Now remember, Father uh, Isaac now, he's blind at this point. And so she has to put skins on Jacob's arms and uh, across his chest because he needs to be, feel hairy like his brother. She also put Esau's clothing on Jacob so he would smell like his brother. They probably never washed their clothes, so you can imagine what maybe it smelled like. And so Jacob then uh, went in to his father. Well, at first, the father, Isaac, now he is very skeptical because he says, your voice sounds like the voice of Jacob, you know. And uh, anyway, finally, though, when he comes over, he gets convinced because uh, he he keeps feeling of his chest and feeling of his arms, and he says, this must be Esau. And uh, so he uh, gives the blessing. He's going to give the blessing now to, to Jacob because of uh, Rebekah's manipulation. But almost on the heels now of Jacob getting the blessing, we find that Esau comes in, and he's got this beautiful meal prepared for his father. And uh, so, oh, you can imagine, he is so upset when he comes in and finds that the blessing has been given to his younger brother. Now, in Genesis 27, 32 and 33, right before Esau came in, uh, that's when Isaac had told the younger son, come and give me a kiss. Well, when he did, and when he smelled the garments, he said, okay, you must be Esau. But when Isaac finishes blessing Esau, like I said, uh, Esau walks in, and he's so furious when he realizes that he has been cheated and the blessing that he thought belonged to him had been given to somebody else. See, Father uh, Isaac, he knew the power of the spoken blessing, and he knew once he gave the blessing, it couldn't be taken back. Now, I want us to realize that the blessing that we can give under the new covenant carries even a stronger blessing than what it did under the old covenant. But so many times, I'm concerned that we don't realize that. We don't remember that. I, I think the patriarchs of old understood that blessing a lot better than we, we do today. But anyway, Esau was devastated when he realized he had been cheated. So in Genesis 27, verse 41, it says that Esau bore a grudge against Jacob, and he swore that as soon as his father died, he was going to kill him. So Rebekah then has to get Jacob to safety. Uh, she, she's gotten him into it now. She's got to do something about it. So she convinces her husband Isaac that they've got to send Jacob away to find a wife. She said, we don't want him to marry one of these heathen women. So we don't want to do that. So she uses that as an excuse. And in Genesis 28.10, Jacob then left Beersheba and headed toward Haram in Genesis 28.12. And on the way now, this is when God gives Jacob the famous dream. Now, this is really important. It, there was a ladder set up on earth, and it, the top of it reached into heaven. And there were angels ascending and descending that ladder. And God was at the top of the ladder, and he was saying to Jacob, I am the Lord God of Abraham and your father Isaac. And he said, I'm going to give you the land, and I'm going to give it to all of your descendants. And he said, in you and in your descendants now, all of the families of the earth are going to be blessed. And he told him, he said, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to protect you wherever you go. What a promise, you know. And he said, then I, he knew he was going to harem. So he said, God said, uh, it was like he said, go ahead and go, but when you come back, you're going to come back to this land. And so he had just started then uh, in his journey to find his wife. So when Jacob awoke, he knew it was a spiritual dream. I mean, he, he was so excited. And so he sets a big stone up as a pillar. He pours oil on it, and he called it Bethel. Now, that's important. I want you to remember that. Then Jacob went on his journey, and his mother's kinfolks, uh, and, of course, he had never met them, but he gets there, and the, uh, the minute he gets there, he sees Rachel, and he just falls madly in love with Rachel the minute he sees her. So for the next 20 years now, he worked for his mother's brother Laban in order to have Rachel be given to him as a wife. Now, if we judge the circumstances around Jacob's leaving, just with our reasoning, 
We would have to think, no wonder Esau was so angry with Jacob. You know, he seemingly had every right to be angry since Esau was born first. The blessing rightfully belonged to him according to their laws in that day. And Jacob and his mother had manipulated, they had cheated uh, un until the, the blessing had been stolen now from Esau. But the Bible tells us not to judge the heart because God alone is the one that knows the heart. So we see that God begins to reveal that Jacob's heart was going to search after God continually. We don't really see it happening quite yet, but he's, he knows that it's going to happen. Now, even though Jacob had manipulated and cheated to get the blessing, we find that Esau doesn't uh, really have a heart that's tender toward God. And uh, <clears throat> we see that the word is going to show us that Esau never had a time when he really sought after God. We don't find one thing about that in Scripture. And he doesn't care about spiritual things. Now, he was only interested now in the physical inheritance that was going to come with the blessing because there was a huge physical inheritance that was going to come. But losing the physical inheritance was enough to bring murderous anger now toward his brother. And he was determined he was going to kill him. Now we're going to find that 20 years later when Esau and Jacob get back together, they're going to be able to make peace when Jacob comes home. Now, the Bible doesn't give us enough detail, but I personally believe that if Rebecca and her son Jacob had uh, trusted God, I, I truly believe that they would not have had to manipulate and cheat. You know, they wouldn't have had to find a way for Jacob to get the blessing. I think it would have been interesting if we could have seen how God would have brought it to pass. But when Jacob and his mother made it happen by deception, and boy, they brought on a lot of problems, and that's why Jacob had to run for his life. And uh, sadly, his mother died. He never got to see her again because she died before he came home. Now, it would have been very interesting to have found out how God would have brought it to pass. We know God would have done it because he had already prophesied it. Uh, but if they had just trusted him, life would have been so much easier. And I thought, you know, if we just trust him every day, life would be so much easier. But they had to learn the hard way. Now, one thing we can be assured of, God's way would have been without evil means and it would have been without evil consequences. God's way doesn't bring the pain and suffering. But sin always builds a web. It always does. Now, immediately after Rebecca and Jacob had sinned to get the blessing now, if you'll remember, they have to sin again then uh, to cover their tracks. And in Genesis 27, 42 through 43, once again, now Rebecca felt like she had to take things into her own hands again. Once we start, you know, manipulating and deceiving, it seems like there's never a stopping place. We have to keep it up. And because we know the wages of sin is death. And so she was in manipulation and the death that it brought about was the separation that came between her and the son that she loved. Uh, he was her favorite son. He was her pride and joy. And she was going to be separated, not only separated from him for 20 years, but actually die before he comes home. Now, if you remember, she was going to send for Jacob uh, when the coast was clear. But evidently, she never saw the coast being clear because she never sent for Jacob. And, uh, you know, don't you know she watched every day? Do you think it's okay? Do you think I could call for him to come home now? And she never felt comfortable. Now, God is going to make Jacob a company of people. And Jacob's going to uh, receive the blessing of his grandfather Abraham. But during this interim period now, Jacob is going to undergo continually uh, the pains now of his being manipulated. He's going to be cheated and manipulated by his uncle, who later became his father-in-law. Now, he's reaping everything that he sowed. He sowed manipulation, and at this point, uh, he's never repented of it. And so now, on the way to his uncle Laban's, we find that he does lay the groundwork for the repentance that's going to happen later. Uh, even though he was still in the manipulation, you know, and he hadn't repented of that. Now, we see the tender heart that's searching for God, though, as much as he knows how. And uh, <clears throat> he, you know, putting up the pillar there and, and recognizing the words coming from God, you could tell he was seeking after God. So Jacob makes a promise to God, and God never forgets the promises that we make. 
and he continually draws us to the place where we can fulfill those promises that we've made. Now, we never find Esau ever making a promise to God. We never find him ever making a vow or a covenant with God. And God doesn't seem to matter to him at all. Now, it's going to be about 20 years before Jacob fulfills that promise, and we're going to find that it's going to be <clears throat> that uh, during that 20 years now that he's going to be continually manipulated by his father-in-law. He put out manipulation, and boy, the, mani the ma manipulation came back in, in droves. He worked seven years for the wife that he wanted, and then on their wedding night, he wakes up the next morning to find that his father-in-law had cheated him and had given him Le Leah instead, Rachel's older sister. And I thought, you know, what would you do in a case like that? You know, what would you do if you woke up the next morning after your wedding night and you found out that you had the wrong woman and not the woman you wanted, you know? Well, he was to work seven more years for his father-in-law. You would have thought that the father-in-law would have said, well, I'm going to also give you the wife since I cheated you. No, he said, no, you work seven more years to get the one that you want. Now, he's still reaping what he's sown because <clears throat> we never see a place where he repented of the manipulation at this point. And so then after 14 years, the next six years, now he was going to work for Laban for, for money, for wages. But the Bible says that Laban changed his wages 10 different times. You know, don't you know that, that was frustrating? Frustrating. Now, every time it looked as though Jacob would be blessed, his father-in-law would pull another stunt and change his wages again. Now, in spite of this, though, we find that God blesses him and increases his flocks, you know. But Laban just becomes more and more jealous because he doesn't understand when he's manipulating, he doesn't understand why Jacob is still being blessed. And to the point that God finally says to Jacob, it's time. I want you to get up, get all of your belongings, everything that belongs to you, and go back now to the land uh, of, of your father. And so in Genesis 31, 13, before he leaves, now God reminds him uh, of the promise that he had made. Now, it's been 20 years, and evidently uh, God has, has never, never even mentioned that promise until now. But in Genesis 31, 13, God said, I am the God of Bethel. Okay, remember, Jacob had called that place where God had spoken to him. He had called it Bethel. Evidently, God had put that in his spirit. And so God is now telling him, go back to that place. I'm the God of Bethel. Now, that was the place where Jacob made the original promise when he first left home. So God is identifying himself now. He's saying, I'm the God to whom you made that promise back 20 years ago. I never forgot the promise you made. And that's all he said about the promise at this time. He was simply reminding Jacob and telling him to uh, return now to the land of his birth. And so in Genesis 31, the last part of verse 13, Jacob obeys and he moves his family, his whole family back uh, to his father's home. But as he gets closer to home, don't you imagine he's remembering who's waiting for him at home. And uh, so <clears throat> fear just begins to overtake him. And he finally is dreading facing his brother Esau so badly, you know. And he's going to divide out his, uh, have them all in little groups and divide them out so that hopefully some of them can be saved. Now it's been 20 years, but he remembers that brother is waiting to kill him. He probably also remembers the fact now that his mother was going to send for him as soon as Esau's anger has subsided. Has subsided. She never sent for him. So Jacob comes up with a plan, and he begins to send gifts ahead of time. Now, by this time, he's wealthy. And so he just keeps sending gifts to Esau. Now, Jacob, I'm sure, is thinking of the principle, you know, you can be sure that your sins are going to find you out. <laughs> so he thinks, I've got to cover these sins, you know. Now, we always have to come to a place of facing up to those things that we do that contradict the Word of God. And when we do face up to those things, we always have to make a choice because that's the point where the choice comes. We're either going to continue in our sinful, manipulative ways or else if, if we decide not to go that route, <clears throat> then we're going to have to see it as an abomination before God until we come with, to God with a broken and a contrite heart over the sin and then truly repent God's way. Well, thank goodness Jacob decided to repent, to go with God. Now, under our new covenant, we have to see it as one of the many sins that helped put Jesus on the cross. We, I mean, it, 
it added to it in the Old Testament, but today it's still adding to the fact that it, it put Christ on the cross until we come to true repentance and true brokenness. And we come, when we come to that place, then God can not only remove the sin, but this is what amazes me. He doesn't just remove the sin. He removes the guilt and the consequences. Now, a lot of Christians don't realize that, but it's very clear in the scripture that he removes the sin when we repent, and then he takes away the guilt, and he takes away the consequences. God is amazing. <laughs> God is amazing. So Jacob faced up to what he had done, and in Genesis 32.10, he starts telling God, I am unworthy of all your loving kindness. Now, he had, we don't see a place where he's repented before now. But he said, Lord, I'm just unworthy of everything you've done for me. And I'm unworthy of all the faithfulness uh, which you have just shown to me over and over and over. And so he says, deliver me now from the hand of my brother Esau, because you said uh, that you would prosper me. You would make my descendants as the sand of the seashore that cannot be numbered. And so he said, Lord, you've said all these things to me. I repent. I'm asking you to do it for me. So Jacob recognizes his unworthiness, and he acknowledges now God as his source. And so finally, he comes to this. Now, he could have said, boy, I've worked for 20 long years, so I deserve what I've gotten. That's what a lot of people do. Instead of saying, God, you've done this for me. So many people say, I've worked. This, this is what I deserve. But thank goodness he didn't do that. He said, Lord, I came over with only a staff in my hand. And you have made me what I have today. So he's acknowledging that it's God who has blessed him. Now, the fear wouldn't have been there if he hadn't sinned and manipulated. But he called out to God in verse 12, based on God's faithfulness and his promises. And that's how we are exactly supposed to do. We have to learn from these Old Testament stories. That's what they're there for. And that's what God wants us to do, is to learn how, that we need to repent, get on our face and repent and acknowledge God as the one who has given us everything that we have. And we need to say, Lord, I truly repent for everything that I've done wrong. And I ask you for forgiveness. And uh, I, I want to do it your way now, Lord. And he's waiting for us to come to that place. Well, finally, Jacob got there. Now, before God could bring deliverance to Jacob, something had to happen down on the inside of him. And it's exactly the same way with us. How many times do we pray and say, Lord, I just need you to do this or need you to do that. Yet, before God can answer that prayer and before he can bring about what we're asking for, some changes have to be made down on the inside of us. Now, Jacob had asked God to deliver him, and now he's got to allow God to make the change in him so that the deliverance is possible. Sometimes we're wondering, Lord, I've been praying and praying, and you haven't answered my prayer. Sometimes we don't realize that God's telling us something we've got to do first. We've got to hear the, the, uh, what we need to do to get ourselves in the right position. Now, the word Jacob means manipulator. It means supplanter. It means cheater. And the angel knew that when uh, the angel was fighting with Jacob the night before he meets with Esau, uh, the angel knows that all that's inside of Jacob. But he wanted Jacob to admit who he was, what he was, and what he had been doing. He, he was trying to get that out of him. He wanted Jacob to come to the place of saying, yes, I am the manipulator. I am the cheater. I am the supplanter, and I repent. That's what he was waiting for. And then the angel said in Genesis 32, verse 28, Okay, now, since you've admitted that and repented, your name now is no longer going to be Jacob. We're not going to call you manipulator. We're not going to call you supplanter any longer. We're going, from now on, we're going to be calling you Israel. And Israel means prince of God. And he said, we're going to do that because you have overcome the sin that was in your life. And you've repented. Now, Jacob couldn't be blessed to the extent that God wanted to bless him as long he's, as he was Jacob the manipulator. It didn't matter how many good, sweet things he did along the way. That sin was there, and it was holding the, the blessings back. And so God could only bless him now to a point. But God could bless him exceedingly and abundantly beyond that when he finally became repented and became Israel, the prince of God. But he had to come up to a place of admitting who he was and what his lifestyle had been. And that's what Esau was never doing. He stopped doing some of the things that were wrong, but he never repented and said, Oh, God, I've done these things. Please forgive me. 
He, he just stopped doing them. And, uh, uh, but, but when Jacob then came to the place where he not only saw it, but he fell on his face and repented, then God could use him. Okay, next week we're going to see a perfect example now of the difference between someone who repents and gets it right with God and up against someone now who just simply changes his mind and decides that he's not going to continue on in that sin. Because we're going to find there's a big difference. Just stopping our wrongdoing is not the same as true repentance. Just stopping and saying, okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. God wants us to get on our face and repent and get the blood of Jesus covering uh, these sins. And when we do, then he removes the sin. He removes the guilt. He removes the consequences and the blessings of God can come upon us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that that's all you ask of us. You just want us to repent and get our hearts right. That's all you, that's all you want. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that we can learn now from this story of Jacob and Esau that that's all you were waiting for. You just wanted uh, both of them to repent and come back to you. And Esau never did that. But, Father, I thank you that Jacob did, and he became then the prince of God. He became Israel. So, Father, we thank you and we bless you for these stories that, that teach us things that are essential for us to learn so that we can absolutely start living the life that you want us to live. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.